Hi there, my name is Will and welcome back to a deep dive of workflow components. Today we're going to be talking about subflows and how you can use these to make your code more modular and reusable. The best way to describe a subflow is think of it like a function that you would find in a typical programming language. It allows you to bundle up orchestration logic into one singular flow and call that flow from another flow. A subflow execution is created when you call your flow from another flow. In order to call your subflow, you can use the subflow task in your parent flow to be able to call the specific flow where you define the namespace and the flow ID. On top of that, you can also access outputs from that subflow and then use those in your parent flow. There are a few additional properties too, including wait, which you can set to true or false. This basically tells your parent flow whether it should wait or continue executing regardless of whether your subflow has finished executing. And there is transmit failed. And this helps you determine whether if the subflow fails, whether your parent flow should fail as well. Let's jump into an example where you can see this in action. This is our subflow, which is simply just making a duck db query which will produce a number of outputs that we can use later on. In order to make this work for the subflow we can specify them here under the outputs property so that it's easy for us to access in our parent flow. The reason this is important is because we don't necessarily know what the outputs will be so being able to explicitly define them makes it easier for our parent flow to know that they exist. And here we have the parent flow and to begin with this is going to call our subflow and as you can see it knows the namespace and the flow ID. We've told it to wait so it will not continue executing until it's finished because the second task actually relies on the output from it. And then transmit failed will also be set to true because again, that second task relies on it. So we need it to fail if it doesn't pass. We can also view the dependencies here to see that these two flows are actually linked. So here you can see that these tasks are reliant on one another. Makes it a little bit easier if you want to be able to figure out how they are all interconnected. Let's execute this and see what the outcome is. We can see that the execution has been created for our subflow. And if we click into that, we can see that it does generate a URI, which contains some data that we're going to want to use in our parent flow. If we jump back to the parent flow, we can actually see that the output that we explicitly defined in the subflow is available here with the same data that we were expecting. And we can actually see if we go to the Gantt chart that it was able to successfully print that out in a shell command. Subflows have a number of additional properties as well that allow you to customize exactly how your subflow will execute. Let's have a look at some of those now. On top of flow ID and namespace, we also have inherit labels, which allows you to inherit the labels from your parent flow and also put those labels on the subflow. Useful for being able to filter how they're connected and which ones executed what. There's also an inputs property allowing you to pass inputs down to the subflow. We'll look at an example on that in a second. There's also a labels property for being able to just specify labels just for the subflow. And there's a revision property as well, which allows you to say which version of the subflow it should use to make sure that your parent flow and your subflow are in sync and there isn't any issues with one being updated and the other not. Here I have an example that is going to make a HTTP request, log the output of that, and then it's going to pass down the output of that to our subflow. Now, as you can see, it's actually passing it down in quite a unique way, trying to get specific information from that JSON body. And it's passing them down as inputs, which is really helpful because then it allows the subflow to do different things depending on the data provided. Now let's have a look at the subflow. As we can see from the subflow here, we've got two inputs which have got default types, but we're gonna override those with our subflow task. And then we are going to simply just log those out to the terminal. One other thing to note is these inputs are nested. We've got users here and then dot first name and dot last name. So when we output inputs dot users, we'll get both the first name and last name field together. So if I execute this on its own, we'll see that the output does have both of those inputs together, but we want to have a look at this running from the parent flow. So let's do that. So when I execute this, we'll be able to see our subflow execute. We can see the data is collected for the API. We can see the output of that here, and then we can see the subflow is successfully created. And when we go over to the subflow and look at executions, we can see that this one was successfully triggered from the subflow. And we can actually see that in the logs, it does give us 
different values to the default values, which would suggest that the inputs were successfully overrided by our parent flow. Subflows are super powerful when it comes to being able to make your code more modular and reusable. Super helpful if you wanna be able to use them between multiple tasks. Maybe think of it like an error handling case. You want all of your flows to use the same error handling where it sends a message to Slack. You can set that up as a subflow and then reuse that same block of logic in all of the flows that you want to have that logic. This makes it super convenient to manage everything in one place rather than having to copy and paste your code. Hopefully you found that useful and you're going to start using subflows inside of your workflows. Let us know in the comments how you're using subflows and how they're making a difference.